what if I told you that using one of these can really upset the way your amplifier sounds? Well, I'm not commenting on the particular quality of this potentiometer, which is questionable, but it's just purely used for an illustration. But I'm going to show you that using a potentiometer just an ordinary logarithmic potentiometer on the input of a power amplifier can seriously upset the way it sounds and the way it measures. And I'm going to prove it. I'm going to show you. After the demonstration, I'm going to tell you why it's the way it is and what you can do to remedy it. But first of all, we're going to look at a demonstration. Now, if you recall my last couple of videos on the dual TDA7293, this is largely what I'm going to use for this demonstration. Now, it doesn't have to be this. It could be equally be the L12 Mark II. All I'm going to use at the moment, I'm going to put a various frequency sine waves directly into the power amplifier. Now, this particular volume control is not in circuit at present. So all we are effectively looking at is the power amplifier module. And in this case, as supplied by the manufacturer. Now, I have posted a video showing how you can improve this amplifier by changing just a couple of components. Now, in this particular amplifier, I have not yet done this. So we're looking at the raw board as it arrived from the maker. So the first test is to apply some tones to the input of the amplifier and so all we have here basically is the raw amplifier and on one channel only on the screen we have one kilohertz and on the meter i'll zoom up in a minute so you can see it on the 0 db scale and the meter is showing that that's the one kilohertz sine wave now i'm going to change it to 20 kilohertz We've now got 20 kilohertz and you can see there's just the mere hint of it dropping down. That's now 30 kilohertz and it is literally, well, slightly less than 1 dB down. So now what I'm going to do is to put the same circuit and do the same test with the potentiometer in circuit. This is the potentiometer I'm using and for this purpose the actual quality of the potentiometer is largely irrelevant because the tests are, are making use of the, the, the working if you like of a potentiometer not the quality of it and it's been used for a variety of performances and different pro things so that's why there's wires everywhere but these wires won't affect this particular test this is the input coming from the oscillator going into the potentiometer onto one channel and coming out on this wire into the back of the amplifier other than that it's exactly the same as the first test i showed so here's the visual interpretation of what we're doing. We're back to one kilohertz. Clearly nothing has changed. We're still at 0 dB. The potentiometer is on four. In other words, there's no attenuation from it whatsoever. We're now at 30 kilohertz, exactly the same as the last test. And we are one dB down. So, so far, the potentiometer, I can't even speak, the potentiometer is giving exactly the same results as it did without the potentiometer. I'm now going to turn the potentiometer to a 
approximately 50% of its rotation, which is about there. In other words, a typical user listening level. In other words, the potentiometer is pointing at 12 o'clock. In other words, 50% of its rotation. Now that's not 50% of its resistance because it's a logarithmic potentiometer, but that, that's largely irrelevant for this test. Added, I've increased the output from the oscillator to compensate for the loss of turning the volume pot down by 50%. But I've recalibrated it and that's now one kilohertz again. And you can see from the meter that we're back to 0 dB. So now we're going to increase the frequency. We are now at 10 kilohertz. But look at the meter. It's nearly 2 dB down now. Let's increase it somewhat. 20k. And look where we are now. Not hi-fi at all. And if I now go to 30k, look how far we are down. We don't listen to 30k. But it's the comparison. Let's make it more realistic. We're now at 20k. Arguably still within the audio band. And very un hi fi. We've got somewhere around about 4 to 5 dB down. So, why do we get these effects when, more importantly, can we, can we fix it? Well, if you think about different types of amplifiers, for example, we've been talking about these um, 7293 amplifiers. Now, clearly, that is just a power amplifier, okay? Now, when you normally buy a hi-fi amplifier, it's, it tends to be known as an integrated amplifier. In other words, it's got various inputs on it. The whole thing is in a box where you can plug all sorts of things in, even a magnetic cartridge. You don't get this mismatch because it has a buffer amplifier built into it. And that's largely what the answer is to this problem. You need a buffer amplifier. And you could ask me, what is a buffer amplifier? Well, it's, it's basically a preamp that doesn't have any gain. In other words, what goes in comes out. And I can hear you saying, well, why would you want to do that? Because if it doesn't do anything, why, why would you want one? And that would be a very, a very reasonable question. Well, what it does do, it produces a low impedance output. It's mainly because the input impedance of most amplifiers tends to be medium impedance. And in the case of valve amplifiers, very high impedance. As you saw by the demonstration, when the volume control is on maximum, you, you don't have any issues because the, the volume control is effectively out of circuit or because it represents a 50k resistance which can be regarded as virtually invisible. But when you turn the potentiometer down, it can represent virtually a short circuit when it's in the minimum position. Obviously, that's why you don't hear any sound. But anywhere between short circuit and full, the resistance and impedance changes as you control, as you move the volume control. And ironically, the worst case is 50% resistance. So, for example, if you have a 50K pot, when the pot is actually 25K, because they interact with the various input filters that you have on a power amplifier, mostly high frequencies because you want to stop 
radio signals going into your preamp. If you add capacitors and resistances together, you do get, it, it's a filter, basically. So that's why you end up with losing some of your HF as the volume is advanced. And you can get around this by feeding it with a low impedance preamp or buffer stage. The only difference between a preamp is that it offers gain and a buffer amplifier purely corrects this impedance mismatch. And coming up in future videos, I'm going to show two such preamps. Well, it's almost a contradiction of terms. I'm going to show you a preamp with a low impedance output and a buffer amplifier with no gain, but just matches the impedance correctly so you don't get this roll off of treble. You can hear the effect of this volume control like this as you turn the volume up because sometimes people will say when the volume control is near maximum um, or, or minimum attenuation so to speak the amplifier sounds better. Well it's not because the amplifier sounds better or your ears sound better it's because you're not getting that high frequency roll off. Now, once again, I have some simulations here, um, kindly done for me by Ron, as per usual. Thank you, Ron. This graph shows the frequency response of an unbuffered amplifier. In other words, imagine the um, 7293, which we've been talking about on the previous, seems like 500 videos. But this is a natural graph taken from that amplifier to, to illustrate the point that you don't want a volume pot on the input. And the graph, the green graph, shows you the effect of the volume control on full, in other words, no attenuation. And you can see the frequency response is textbook virtually. When you're, if you look at the other, um, the pink trace, it shows you the effect of the volume control at 50% and clearly very unhi-fi. And you tend not to really notice it simply because you turn it down slowly and you don't really notice it other than the fact you 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 could well be conscious that the amplifier doesn't appear to sound as good with lower volume. And it's partially an effect on your ears that louder tends to sound better. In this case, you can clearly see the effect of the volume control. If you had a buffer preamp in front of the volume control, this effect wouldn't happen because you'd effectively be feeding a low impedance into the amplifier. That's what the next couple of videos is going to be about, by the way. So stay tuned. Now, while we're talking about this, there's a couple of other things I should throw in. The worst possible thing you could do to an amplifier is connect passive tone controls to it. Now, you get people saying, oh, these are much better tone controls because they're passive. Passive tone controls are not a good idea. First of all, they have a, a huge attenuation, so you need extra amplification on the input. With the same effect that I've mentioned to you with the volume control, imagine having filters i.e. the bass and treble controls going into the amplifier. The impedance variations is horrendous. Please don't go with the idea that passive tone controls are good. People say they're good because they don't have any distortion, um, because there's no gain on it, but you still have to put the gain in front of that, so you haven't <laughs> to coin a phrase, gained anything. 
and you've actually got a worse sounding control system because of the impedance matches. It's much better to have, if you must have tone controls, have them in a pre-stage mixed with negative feedback like a back sandal type control. Okay, so we've, we've decided that passive tone controls are best put in the dustbin or a trash can if you're American. Now the other thing that is a taboo is to feed a, 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 a solid state amplifier with a valve preamp. Now we all know, well some of us don't know this yet, but they will learn in time. Valves do not sound good. They really don't. If you're under the illusion that they sound better than a transistor amplifier, you're fooling yourself. But anyway, if you, if you want to believe that, I'm not going to upset you unduly if you're not already unset, upset. This is the reason why never, never, never feed a valve preamp into a transistor amplifier. And it's purely, it's a very, very simple thing. Again, it's impedance. Your amplifier wants to see a low impedance input. I've proved that. A valve preamp. A valve is basically a high impedance device. And if you're feeding it with a high impedance, which a valve will always be high impedance, 10K or even higher, because you pick up the signal from the anode of the valve, which is very high impedance. So you can imagine, in fact, I've got a graph here to simulate it. This graph shows a 10K input impedance. Just, just don't do it because it will not sound good. And you see these little valve preamps on um, AliExpress and things like that. And if you measure them in isolation, they're not too bad. Well, they're crap actually. <laughs> they were very nice in 1940, uh, but this is 2023, I think. And all you can say about valves are they look pretty, there's nothing good about a preamp valve. They're microphonic, they're hissy, and they have high distortion, but they look pretty. Thank you so much for watching. I do appreciate every single one of you. And leave comments. I read all your comments. And if it's something I can answer, I will do so.